I felt the animals had conspired in a supreme act of revenge for my incarcerating them to bring this evening to disastrous ruin. These are true tales of my African adventures. May this inspire you, deter you, caution you, and above all, entertain you. During late 1977, my business partner, Peter, had received word that two baby grizzly bears were for sale from a breeder in Natal. Two grizzlies for our new zoo, fantastic, I thought. These were purchased and then raised. Raising the cubs began in Peter's home and lasted for several months until virtually all his possessions had been destroyed by them. Meanwhile, we were painstakingly completing construction of our rustic rural zoo outside Cape Town. A cuter animal than a baby bear you can hardly find. The baby bears would cling to one's leg like a furry growth and raise all hell if any attempt was made to pry them loose. The problem with grizzly bears is that they grow up and up and up. At last the zoo had been completed and was ready to open. It was well received by all and sundry. The zoo was quite delightful and hosted a number of animals, reptiles, birds and a ridiculous donkey whose speciality was creeping up on one, then braying into one ear or the other at the top of his voice, causing near heart failure every time. We had a monkey he was a deceptive thief with a sick sense of humour. He would lure his victim to the wire, feigning affection, when he had lulled his unsuspecting victim into a sense of trust and good cheer, he would deftly snatch some item of value out of a shirt or jacket pocket and retreat to a perch just out of reach. At this point, he would examine the stolen item as if interested in it and then, in a display of apparent utter boredom, break the item, glasses, a pen, a box of cigarettes, etc., into little pieces and toss them heedlessly to the ground. Many of his victims, I am sure, would have gladly wrung his scrawny neck if they were able to. I remember my father visiting one day. He was standing peering into the crocodile enclosure when one of our parrots, a tame bird, flew of all places into the open croc enclosure and landed at the water's edge to drink. A bit like going for a beer in a lion's den. As I walked past, I asked my father what it was that he found so interesting. Well, he said, our parrot had come to drink water out of the croc dam. Parrot, croc dam? Oh, I said, so what happened? One of the crocs ate it, he said dryly. Can you imagine that? Such was life at the zoo. When I met my wife, Dawn, I didn't know she was my wife yet. I chose to take her to a secret destination, the zoo, at night, with no torch, the lights were out, I think there was a power failure, and I did this in a fit, I think, of masculine bravado, hoping to clinch the boyfriend-girlfriend deal with my acts of clear bravery and prowess. A twit of note I was. As we alighted from my vehicle and adjusted our eyes to the dark, the donkey performed its party trick, almost causing Dawn to collapse in a trembling heap. I had forgotten the large baboon brought to us by a nature conservation officer from Cape Point where it had been captured after terrorizing motorists. It was in a large trap cage ready for introduction to its new prison the following day. As we walked past the notorious beast it lunged out, gripping my ample hair, and drew me into the steel of its trap with a loud bang. It was twice as strong as I in my prime, and tried to bite my head through the openings in the steel mesh. 
I wrestled myself free, leaving a good portion of hair behind. Things were not going well. Dawn was at this time probably reconsidering life on the continent, never mind with me, as I led her deeper into the dark and wooded zoo. Now it was the turn of the rattlesnake. Yes, we had rattlesnakes from America. I felt the animals had conspired in a supreme act of revenge for my incarcerating them to bring this evening to disastrous ruin, foiling this Romeo's chances of any favourable outcome. The rattlesnake was a large, very large, diamond-back rattlesnake, and it chose this very still, I can hear a pin drop night, to produce a long, ominous rattle, using its oversized rattle like a Mexican dancer with multiple castanets. Before I could speak, I found Dawn in my arms, not because she was attracted to my irresistible body, but because she needed to get her feet off the ground to avoid the imminent attack of the castanet rattlesnake. From not good to worse, I had one last trick up my sleeve to redeem the evening. Show her Caesar, the half-tame Cape Mountain leopard, I thought. This large, heavy leopard purred like a V8 engine and enjoyed a scratch through the wire. He also had a mean streak, however, which he was not going to show tonight, I prayed. As we approached the enclosure, I noticed he was nowhere to be seen. Oh God, I thought, he's going to do it. He's mean, but I mean... As we reached the wire, he exploded out of a dark corner, fangs bared and snarling. He hit the fence in full flight. Dawn was thrust backward with the subtle energy of this mock attack, and I had to help her limp from shock back to the vehicle. Moral, you own a zoo, don't do what I did. We did not talk much that night. Oddly enough, we have been married for 31 years. A grizzly bear is a monster. This bulky, tall, fast, strong, determined animal plays second fiddle to no one. We were not animal trainers, so we did not tame or train these behemoths. When constructing their enclosure, we were low on funds. Zoos usually are. And we used 12 millimeter weld mesh to construct their permanent enclosure. This is not a very secure means of construction for the likes of a grizzly bear. They remained in their enclosure, I am sure, out of habit alone, as they could have walked through the mesh at any time, having now reached adulthood. Their diet was mostly dead chicken. It was on the cards. Sooner or later they would break out, talk about prison break, we had prison break one and two. Could have had a series. I was away at the time of the first escape. Don't forget, no cell phones in those days. The bears, now closer to three meters when standing erect on their back legs, had playfully parted the weld mesh and were on the hunt. No chicken on the menu tonight. Some distance from the zoo, there were three rudimentary mud huts. Local laborers occupied the huts with their families and dogs. The smell of cooking and dogs had attracted the bears. As one of the laborers later related, one of the dogs was alerted to something in the dark. It started barking, and before they could react, a giant animal bore down on the dog. What does a dog do when he is chased? Runs back into the house, of course. So the dog ran into the hut to escape the bear, and the bear ran into the hut to catch the dog, taking out the door frame and surrounding brickwork as he entered, then passed straight through the wall at the back of the hut, leaving a gaping hole, roughly shaped like a grizzly bear, I thought to myself silently. The bears unable to find the dogs and not being able to find the human occupants, 
who had excelled themselves in legging it out of the place, wandered back to the zoo where they caused general mayhem. One of the labourers arrived at Peter's house and described the attack by the giant bear. Peter needed no further explanation. A friend of ours who worked at an institution where dart guns were a necessary tool was summoned to help, dart gun in hand. Later that night the bears were successfully incarcerated. The cage was repaired and no incident occurred for several months. Now it was my turn. The call came. The bears are out. Come now. This was Peter's frantic voice. I raced to the zoo. It was 9 p.m. on a dark night. Earlier in the day, we had been cutting gum poles from the surrounding gum forest for a new enclosure. The poles were approximately two meters long, 100 millimeters in diameter, wet and heavy. They were stacked near the car park. As I scrambled from my truck, I hesitated, not knowing what I was to face. Then Grace caused me to arm myself with one of the felled, trimmed poles. It was hard to lift and carry and seemed an impossible weapon to wield. It was all I had. In the next moments I experienced what so many hapless American adventurers must have experienced in the forests of North America. A full-on bear attack. Not any bear, a grizzly bear. Only one who has experienced such an event could appreciate the awesome size of the grizzly bear raised on its hind legs, close to three meters above the ground, and the terror it instills, arms built like giant furry legs, paws like dinner plates, claws centimeters long, and the tongue, oh, that tongue and the lips. The bear looming large out of the darkness bore down on me, not fast, but at a steady pace, upright, arms outstretched, claws protruding, lips turned back, huge yellow teeth exposed, and the tongue lunging outward towards me as it roared a bear roar I had never heard before. Thank God for that companion, adrenaline. I felt the pole in my hands, at first too heavy, now just right. I swung the pole and struck the bear on the forehead. A loud crack, followed by mixed emotions. I have killed the bear. I have cracked its skull. Now what? The bear sank onto its haunches, perhaps fatally wounded. Not on your bloody life. He probably thought he had just been massaged. He rose again, this time on all fours. As it appeared he was about to advance for the second time, he turned and followed Peter, who had all the while been frantically waving a dead chicken in the background, hoping to lure the bear away from me. Well, thank God it worked. As Peter trotted past the door of the enclosure, the bear hot on his heels, he tossed the chicken through the door. The bear skidded, made a sharp right, grabbed the chicken, sat on his backside and began crunching away. We wired up the cage. We sold the bears. I heard they broke out of their new enclosure as well. I don't know what happened. I didn't want to know. I was done with bears. <laughs>